it's, it's cool to have you know a, a different amount of diversity and not really have it's not just this you've got to be really good at it you've got to be really athletic you get to enjoy it you know the whole along the way regardless of your athletic ability yeah and it, it's it is not like a sport like tennis where you need to have like really good technique in order to get the ball over the net mm. it's very easy to get the ball over the net and pick a ball so you don't have to worry about taking all these lessons and stuff. You don't need that. The first time you go play pickleball, you will have fun. Knowledge is power. Reality is... Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome. I hope you're having a fantastic day. I am here with Lynn Cherry of Pickleball Fire. Hello. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about pickleball today. Um, so I think we should start out right off the bat. Just, uh, you know, we can kind of assume there might be a couple of people who don't even know what pickleball is. Um, I was telling one of my coworkers last night uh, about this podcast and he didn't even he hadn't even heard of pickleball before. So it was kind of fun to describe it to him. And also, as I was describing it to him, I realized I don't even know that much about it either. So I'm glad I have you here today, Lynn. Um, will you give me kind of a, how about just what is pickleball? That's the perfect place to start. You know, it's a really interesting sport that's very easy to play, but it's kind of a combination of tennis and ping pong and badminton. And interestingly enough, it's played with a ball that's really similar to a wiffle ball, which is one of the things that makes it easy to play. And you don't use a racket that has been strung like a tennis racket or a racquetball racket or even a badminton racket. It's actually a paddle and it's uh, roughly 15 inches by eight inches. So it's lightweight, probably weighs about eight ounces. It's really small, easy to maneuver and that's a, actually a big reason why it, it's so fun to play the game is, you know, anybody can play it regardless of their age or what, um, you know, whether they've played a sport or not. Right, right. And so it's it's the same thing. It's, we have a net. We have how, how many people are typically um, on a team? Is it two versus two or? Yeah. It, interestingly enough, pickleball, um, the, the game is really played. Most people, probably 90, 95% of the people who play actually do play doubles. So you've got a partner there on the court and the court itself, it's uh, the size of a badminton court. So it's a lot smaller than a tennis court. A badminton court is about 20 by 44 feet, which actually has similar size to a racquetball court, which is 20 by 40 uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it is played, um, you can play singles, but most people play doubles. I think a lot of it is just because it's such a social sport and playing doubles, it's a little bit more like playing chess. So there's actually a lot of strategy involved, you know, more so than singles. Singles is a little bit more like tennis where it's about hitting the ball hard, but when you play doubles, it's really a lot more about placing the ball in the right spot on the court. Right, right. Okay, well, so so how do you fit into this? Because you have a PhD in sports psychology and your master's in physical education, correct? Right. Right. So so where, where do you fit into this? How did you stumble into this? You know, I, I did. I literally stumbled into this. I was uh, lived in Texas for 25 years before moving to Connecticut in 2018. So just three years ago. And I was looking for something to do during the winter. And, you know, since I had always been very athletic, I just looked to see what was going on at the local recreation center. And there was something called pickleball, which I, like many people, have never had never at the time heard of the sport. So I, you know, look at it on YouTube and I'm like, oh, yeah, I think especially given my racquetball background that I would probably really like it. So I uh, shortly after I moved here, you know, just a week or two after I got here. It was still a little cold outside, so I went to the local recreation center and just kind of peeked my head in the gym to see, you know, what it looked like in, in person. And as soon as I came to the door, and this is this is literally what happens almost everywhere where you go play pickleball, as soon as I poke my head in the door, they're like, oh, you got to come in and play. And I'm like, well, I don't have a paddle. And they're like, oh, here, you can use mine. You know, try it out. You know, it's just that's the amazing thing about the sport. It's just, you know, people are are so welcoming. And I was so, I was really happy to be able to participate 
in pickleball because a few years before that I had torn my ACL and I did not get it surgically repaired. So I was, had really stayed away from playing court sports because of my knee problems, but it's on a small enough court that the game actually can be really fast, but it doesn't quite require as much movement as if you're on a bigger court, like in, in tennis. Um, so yeah, I mean, as soon as I started playing, I actually started the pickleball fire website because I was just so into the sport and, you know, that's what you'll hear from so many people is that, you know, you almost immediately become addicted to it. It's, it's amazing. Huh. I mean that, that friendly community, that very welcoming vibe of, yeah, come on in, try it out. Like here, here's my racket. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's how you, that's how you have a community grow right there just uh authentically just by being friendly and welcoming to newcomers and stuff um is there a reason why you didn't um get your get your knee your acl uh, surgery or is that you know what does does it affect you now or no not not really uh you know the reason i didn't get the surgery was it's um it's a difficult surgery because i completely tore it so i had you know some people when they tear their acl that anterior cruciate ligament is still a, attaching, you know, to the, to the right places. It just kind of torn. Mine was completely gone. So mm. it's a very major surgery and it's a very long recovery. So I actually uh, specifically investigated uh, orthopedics options in terms of the doctors. And I wanted to find somebody who didn't just want to go in and cut. I mean, that's, you know, orthopedic surgeons, that's what they do. Mm. And so I found somebody after doing a lot of research who might give a little other opinion. And, and he said, you know, you don't have to get it repaired. And, um, you know, you can just go through physical therapy. The, the recovery, um, you know, was probably almost the same length of time, you know, compared to the surgery, because there's a lot of PT and a lot of rehabilitation. And I think the last time I went to see him, I basically said, well, you know, I've always been really athletic. Can I play court sports? Because it's that side to side movement. If you've done something to your knee, that tends to be really hard on it. And he says, look, if the muscles surrounding your knee are strong enough, sure. Mm -hmm. And he says, I have a friend who plays indoor soccer and um, he never had his repaired either. And he plays indoor soccer, which is, you know, one of the toughest things to do, you know, if you've got a knee problem. So yeah, that's kind of my story. I, once I started playing pickleball, it was, um, you know, actually my right knee has been bothering me, which is not the one that, that I injured severely, but, uh, I've kind of done my PT on that too. And, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty good to go now. Yeah. Right on. So do you have a, do you have a pretty, um, thorough, like pre warm up stretching, um, sort of, sort of exercise? Like how, how do you make sure your body, um, is, is ready for, for each pickleball event? You know, I've actually gotten much better at that. The the good thing is that most people, when they first come to the pickleball court and they're warming up, they're hitting the ball really softly and we call it dinking. And it's basically where you're hitting the ball over the net and it's landing in what we call the kitchen. And the kitchen is seven feet from the net on both sides of the court. So the just the way most people warm up, it's perfect to really kind of, you know, it's almost like dynamic stretching, even though technically it isn't because it's just your body's in motion, you're hitting really soft shots, you know, and most people are pretty darn good about, you know, warming up for a good 10 minutes, which is at least what you need. So I've, I've gotten much better in terms of um, what I do after I play, you know, a lot more stretching, more typical, you know, static type stretching afterwards and really working on knee exercises and hamstring exercises. And that's largely been because my right knee has been bothering me. Uh, you know, even though the left one is the one that was really severely hurt. Yeah. That's the thing. You got to be listening to your body. Like what's going on right now? What, you know, not only what are my past injuries, what do I need to make sure I'm you know, uh, building up those muscles around them to support that injury, but also what's going on now, right? We always got to kind of check in. What am I feeling? What do I need today? What do I need this week or this, this month, you know, getting in tune with kind of, uh, uh, how our body is continuously fluidly always moving and changing and giving us different feelings and, and, uh, 
you know, sparking different emotions with us. So just to, to, um, kind of tune into your, your sports psychology, um, uh, uh, brain a little bit. The, I really like how you were talking about, um, support your, or you, you and your physical therapist were talking about supporting the muscles around the injury. Um, I, I think that that's something that we, we miss often. I, I think there, I mean, obviously there's not a, a blanket statement that you can give for everybody's injuries, you know, and we're all, all of our bodies are different and different areas of our, our bodies are different nonetheless. Uh, uh, but what does it mean to you to kind of strengthen the muscles around an injury? Because it, it seems like we're often kind of told or we think it's just don't move it, completely let it heal on its own. Um, but I, I kind of like once we're able to, I feel like I, I would rather try to strengthen the muscles around it, try to build up support of the area that's injured, um, kind of re- retrain it. So because you were able to, I'd be curious to see what what the x-rays or whatever would look like for your ACL um, when it was torn and, and versus now. Like are the muscles around it just supporting it really well? Has it kind of healed itself? Um, so basically my question is, what, what do you what do you think about this building the muscles around the injury rather than just staying off it, don't touch it, don't move it, stay bed rest sort, sort of thing. Do, do you see a, a big difference in that? You know, what I find is that I was with my knee as soon as I was able to, I, I just went to a physical therapist. I mean, because the physical therapist that I went to was great because he believed in building up your your core. So kind of starting from the from the ground up. And, you know, the exercises actually then were much more than just doing it for the knee. You know, it was, you know, doing it for the, for the hip and the, and the ankle, you know, just kind of strengthening that. And and even actually even up into, you know, strengthening the stomach muscles and whatnot. So he had a very, very holistic approach and granted my injury was very serious Now, more recently, I've gone to physical therapy for my right knee, which was not technically torn, but I could feel my ACL and it was, it was really sore. And so his approach was a little bit different where it was much more about strengthening, you know, the knee muscles and, you know, making, I'd like really tight hamstrings. So I, I visited a couple times. And then once I was comfortable with the exercises, I pretty much do them, if not every night, every other night. And now that I've been doing them, my, both my knee pain and my really tight hamstrings have kind of kind of gone away. So that's the, that's the thing is like you were saying before, being in tune with your body is so important because I went through a period where my hamstring was so tight, I didn't want to tear it. And I, I took a couple of days off from playing pickleball. You know, I just... I just walked and it was even, you know, sore walking. So I know if I'm sore walking that I really do not want to be on the pickleball court, you know, straining that much and, you know, creating a bigger issue. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Just listening to your body. So important. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's certainly times to, to, like I was saying, push past it and, you know, maybe strengthen those muscles around it when you can muster it, but there's also a time to listen to your body and rest you know, give it that time to heal on it on its own. I, uh, I do, uh, I'm, I'm running is, is a big thing for me. I do a lot of running. Um, and I feel that the way that I continuously stay able to run, you know, four or five times a week, it, uh, by not being sore is stretching. Like stretching is so big to me. You'll really never find me these days. Um, just heading right out the door and going for a run without at least having 10, 15 minutes of stretching. Um, I do some sort of some sort of, you know, kind of slow movement yoga, some sort of like primitive exercises um, to, to wake my body up. And it's not just that I'm stretching my legs, right? You know, I'm stretching my whole body. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, a- activating my core. I'm trying to get my arms in the right spot so my shoulders aren't kind of sitting weird during during my run. So, yeah, I'm always I'm always just trying to uh, pinpoint the the um the area around stretching before any athletic activity because years and years ago i was kind of like a bro power lifter guy and i didn't really stretch and i thought it was dorky and i would just go in there and i I, luckily i didn't have any major injuries but uh, i'm sure like the weird sorenesses that i had or any um i think i could have been a lot better athlete if i would have added in the stretching aspect of things um so the the community behind pickleball so you know looking through your website 
it's you, you kind of realize that it's it's almost a lot bigger than than I thought. You know, it's there's a, like a pro level. Um, there's a lot of different people. You've had a ton of people on on your podcast on Pickleball Fire. Um, so what what is this what is this whole community like? Do you do you because like I mentioned at the beginning, not a lot of people know about pickleball or in in my world anyway. A couple couple people that I've talked to, this is anecdotal, of course. A couple people that I've talked to don't know a ton about pickleball. Um, so is it's this big this big thing? It has its own community. Um, there's there's pros. Like, t- tell me about the the pro level. Do do you watch? Um, is is it like streamed online? Is there events for for the pro level? What's what's the community like for it? It's really interesting. The Pickleball never had a pro tour until 2020. Of course, right during the pandemic, Mm. there were two pro tours that launched at that time. So needless to say, they didn't have a big schedule in 2020. But with the launch of the pro tour, you definitely have, you know, streaming on, on YouTube. And then this year, there's getting to be more regular coverage on ESPN and the CBS network. Now, prior to the Pro Tour launching in 2020, there's um, kind of the U.S. Open and then the Nationals for Pickleball. And those were events where there was some prize money, but it wasn't a lot of prize money. But there was some coverage on TV, like they would take, you know, from the whole tournament, they'd take and like put an hour on, I think, CBS Network. So really in 2021 here now, it's really exploded in terms of the professionals. And I I went to watch my first professional event. I happened to be in LA visiting my brother in Burbank and there was an event down in San Clemente, California. So that was put on by the Professional Pickleball Association. And it was at a Lifetime Fitness and it was a, they had like a beautiful stadium court so that's where the featured pro matches were because it's like a stadium court for tennis and they put three pickleball courts on it. And so the, the venue was, was beautiful. And, you know, just being there in person, I mean, the pros are amazingly athletic. It's really interesting. That's, that's probably been one of the biggest changes over the years. I was talking with um, Kyle Yates, who's only in his mid twenties but he started playing 10 years ago. And I think he said in 2016 was when he realized that, you know, he could probably make a living playing pickleball. Now, now it's not a living based upon prize money fully at this point, it would definitely be, yes, I can, I can win some prize money, but I can also teach pickleball and travel around the country. And he does his own, own clinics and whatnot. So he was, uh, one of the first people to come into the sport who was really young and really athletic. He was like a top 30 tennis player in Florida. Mm. And uh, he it, 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 actually, I, that was in high school. Um, and, and so, yeah, he's was like one of the first young athletic guys or people to really come into the sport. And, you know, he just, he just dominated 2016, 17 and 18. And then, now we've got some some more young ones. And Kyle, I think he said he's like, you know, the the skill level of the people has kind of, you know, at the top level and the pros has really kind of gone above and beyond the game itself because there, there's a lot of people. There's 4.2 million people who actually play pickleball. Um, that is not a small number of people. And, it, you know, if you're in Florida, you've definitely heard about pickleball. You couldn't miss it. And in the Northeast, it's a lot more popular here, I think, because you have so many snowbirds. So they, you know, over the years, have gone down to Florida, you go back and forth. So I had just talked to somebody in um, Dallas, because I've been away from Dallas area for now f- for three years. And I'm like, I had never heard of pickleball when I was there. And he says, he says, Lynn, it's, it's getting really big in Austin, but Dallas, it's growing more slowly, but it's finally starting to grow. He said, like, in all of the Dallas Fort Worth area, which is, you know, two or 3 million people, at least there's probably four pickleball courts. <laughs> oh. Now they, they are playing pickleball there. They, they play, you know, at tennis clubs, but like dedicated courts. Cause where I live in Connecticut, I can drive 15 minutes and there's, you know, six dedicated courts. I drive 20 minutes and there's eight dedicated courts, you know, purely for pickleball. So it's, um, it's, it's really amazing. The growth. 
Yeah, yeah, it's certainly growing. I mean, I imagine if we didn't have, of course, the the pandemic and the lockdowns, it could have just started to kind of skyrocket right there too. You know, actually, that that really helped pickleball. Oh, uh, did it? The, yeah, the New York Times called pickleball the perfect pandemic sport because it's outdoor. You've okay. got a small number of people on the court, so pickleball grew twenty percent during the pandemic. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. amazing. Yeah, so so I'm actually coming to you um, from Austin, and two days ago I was uh, uh, I was driving up kind of by the Zilker Park area, if if you're familiar with that, and uh, I had to to go around some people playing pickleball right in front of their house in in, in the street. So it, it was pretty cool to see because I knew that we had this podcast coming, um, and I recognized their uh, their paddles. And so, yeah, there's, and, there's people playing in the streets of Austin. Yeah, and and that's what a lot of people did during during the pandemic because the pickleball court's fairly small. You can set up in the street, you can set up in your driveway. You know, the nets, you know, twenty feet across. Um, that's that's another reason why they said it was a, a great sport um, because it's easy, it's small enough, and it's great for you know the whole family. You know, anybody can play it. You know, grandma who's eighty five years old can play it, and you know the youngsters who are you know four and five can play. Yeah, that's so great. It would be really cool to start seeing pickleball at you know uh, holiday events. It'd just be a normal thing in America. I, w- I would like to see that. Um, so the uh, l- let's talk equipment a little bit. So I came from a skateboarding background growing up. I was um, manager and assistant manager at skate shops and whatnot. And to me, um, the the difference between say like a Walmart skateboard and what we would sell at the at the skate shop was just night and day. It was, you know, if, if, if anybody's interested in skateboarding, I'm like, Hey, spend the extra, whatever it is. Don't get that stuff. Like the, the Walmart skateboard is not what you want. You know, uh, they don't even have real bearings. It's, it's made of all this different material. Um, it's, it's, it's just not, not the same thing. It's di- differently. It's pressed differently, different plies, all these things. Um, is, is there any sort of that correlation in pickleball? Is there some stuff to maybe stay away from? Is there worth spending 10 more bucks to get a, a nicer racket? What's the equipment like in that world? Yeah, it's really all about the paddle. And in terms of paddles, the thing I would not recommend is to buy a wooden paddle. For maybe $10 more, you can get a graphite paddle. And that's just like your skateboarding analogy. So somebody in your family, once you buy those paddles, is going to enjoy the game. Go ahead and spend another $10 to get a paddle that's not wood anything other than wood is you're you're good to go okay yeah because I, I would have honestly thought wood i thought i figured they were probably wood paddles you, you can still buy wood pickleball paddles but i i don't recommend them at all you know even for kids i really don't recommend them right right okay and, and you do i think you do have information um on what equipment you recommend on your website am i correct with that I do. I do. I've got a number of reviews of of different gear and, you know, just to give people an idea to get into the sport of pickleball. um, If you're, you know, to buy four paddles and a couple balls, you know, you can spend 50, $60 and, you know, nets are a little bit more expensive, but hopefully, you know, there's courts nearby, but you you can at least get kind of a small 10 or 12 foot net for maybe 40 or $50. So just to get started, you can spend a hundred dollars and, for four people and you know that pretty much will get you started right right and and that's i mean that's probably something that that is very helpful to do and something obviously i want to try to push people towards with just this podcast episode is just getting started with it i think you know if, if it sparks your interest if it's something that sounds interesting to you um you know what why not give it a shot it's a fairly inexpensive sport all, all things considered comparatively to all these other sports um, so, so getting started, I mean, again, on your website, you have, I think the basics on, um, instructions and, and rules and, and whatnot, I believe, um, on, on your website. So if someone wants they, they get, you know, they spend their hundred bucks and their family gets their, uh, their paddles and, and their balls and their net and they set it up. Like it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to, to do. Right. I mean, it's, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the rules or the game are, are really easy. And, um, you know, in terms of actually just, you know, hitting the ball and whatnot, because as I mentioned, a, a lot of the game can be up near the net, but about seven feet from the net. So there's actually a lot of soft shots. And, it, you know, if somebody has never played a sport, it's a great sport to get into. In fact, when you've got sometimes when you're teaching beginners and they're they haven't really de- didn't have a sporting background, a lot of the instructors will just take 
take a ball and have the people throw the ball, you know, so not hitting it with the paddle, but just, you know, throw the ball to each other underhanded because that mimics like a dink, which is a soft shot and pickleball. So just is if you can throw the ball underhanded over a net, you can play pickleball. That's actually how easy it is. Right. I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And remember it's, it's played with a wiffle ball. So it, well, it's, it's like a wiffle ball. So the ball is, the ball's pretty light. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not hard on your elbows or your wrists. There's been a lot of people who actually, there's been a number of pros who I've talked to women who had wrist injuries and whatnot, and they could no longer play tennis, but they could play pickleball just because everything is, is lighter. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, lot less intense too, you know, um, it, is the, so the pickleball itself, the, they're the wiffle ball rather, w- would you call it the pickleball? Is that, would that be proper? Like yeah. Is- yeah. P- people, people don't call it a wiffle ball. They call it a pickleball. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That would probably make sense. Um, what, what is the, is, is there a specific, you know, cause a golf ball, for example, would have a specific dynamic, um, or, a, a dimensions rather that it needs to be, what's the dimensions for, a? uh, yeah, a it's a little bit bigger than, a tennis ball or a baseball, but a little bit smaller than a softball. So it's kind of in between. Okay. Okay. I'm visualizing that. Yeah, I can see that. Um, hey, so on your, on your podcast, you've had quite the journey on your podcast. I mean, you're almost at 80 episodes from what I saw on, on the site. What, what, what has this been teaching you? I mean, this is probably, this is a whole nother side that you've probably got to experience, you know, not just your, your love and enjoyment um, for the, for the sport and the community around you, for the people you're interacting with. Um, but now you get to reach out to all these other different people who you probably wouldn't have met without, without the podcast and the website. What has the podcast journey been like for you? Oh, that's actually a great question. You know, the pan, uh, the podcast was, was actually something that came out of the pandemic. You know, I started it in October, 2020, you know, kind of moving into the cold months in Connecticut and, you know, we're not going out and doing anything. I was really conservative during the pandemic. So yeah, that that's how it got started. And I did have a journalism background. So I was comfortable interviewing people. I had done a lot of sports reporting when I was in high school and college. And so I was, you know, comfortable interviewing people. I had to learn about some of the, you know, technical pieces of actually doing a podcast. But I, I early on, I made that really efficient because at the time I was, uh, still working full-time at my job and I was just doing the podcast on the side, but that's, what's so great about pickleball too, is that I, I really didn't know anybody in the industry in pickleball. When I started the podcast, I didn't know any professional players. And I started off, I think interviewing my very first interview was with what they call a pickleball ambassador. Now I had never heard of, an ambassador in the sport before. And I've played just about every sport imaginable, but there are actually people who are associated with the USA pickleball association and they have to sign up and, and answer a bunch of questions. And, you know, basically, you know, they're, they're become an official pickleball ambassador and their role is to introduce people to the sport and they can, uh, you know, teach beginners and help them out. Actually, they can't, I think officially they can't charge any money for doing that. But, um, you know, they're basically there to help people get started in the sport, help grow the sport. They they promote the sport. You know, they'll put, up, put together, you know, drop and play, you know, just where you can come anytime and kind of arrange that. And, you know, like I said, they often do do clinics and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, and that was your first ep- first guest episode. Yeah, yeah, that was the with Ky- yeah, that was with Kyle Snay. He was uh, a USA pickleball ambassador, and he's actually somebody who, oh man, the pictures. He had some great pictures of the clothing that he wears. He like wears these outfits on the court, and we're not talking about you know, you know, like Halloween outfits or anything like that. Just very colorful clothing okay. that matches from head to toe, and he's like you know pretty tall guy, you know, he's a big guy. And, uh, you know, from he's, he's got, you know, matching shoes with his socks and shorts and shirt, oh, I love and even it. his I love headband. It. It, yeah. <laughs> great, great pictures. So, so he's got like this whole character that goes with his, with his pickleball ambassadorness. 
Yeah, and and the reason he does it is because, and part of the reason he does it is because people will come up to him on the court. You know, people feel like they can approach somebody who's dressed like that, uh, and you know, wherever he plays or if he goes to a tournament, people will say, "Hey, I saw your pictures on Facebook. I just wanted to meet you." And you know, it's just very, you know, he very welcoming personality and, and person. And uh, that's how a lot of the ambassadors are, but all the, they don't all wear the, the uh, matching clothing like that. Very yeah, colorful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how fun though. I mean, that, that's really cool. That's uh, you know, to, uh, it, that, that is a good point that you mentioned is it does kind of open this door. It has this openness to it of when you're wearing something like that, you're, you're willing to be approached like to, to kind of yes. talk about it. So to, that is cool that he's kind of the face of what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, he he doesn't uh, hesitate to uh, stand out, and and one of the pros who doesn't hesitate to stand out, his uh, his name is Gizmo, and he also has uh, some very colorful outfits. And he told me specifically, yeah, I I do this to stand out. I want people to approach me. I want to talk to them, you know, get to know them, you know, welcome them, you know, help them out, teach them. So that that's you know that's pickleball. That's just how it is. Uh, it's so fun. It sounds like such a great community, honestly. Um, I, I do a, a little bit similar of something. So um, the last 10 years, I've been a DJ, actually. And I always, I, I've always liked fashion anyway. I've kind of dressed a, a bit more obtusely in a lot of ways, um, sometimes really colorful, sometimes just all the same color, whatever. Um, but I kind of have that where I'll wear a certain outfit or I'll dress a certain way. And it's kind of the way of me stepping into my character. So it's I'm wearing this thing. I've got, you know, it almost is like a costume in a, in a strange way, but it does kind of help me step into this. Okay, I'm I'm now entertaining these people. They're they're coming to have a good night. They're they're coming, um, you know, they paid money or they're here out out on their their night out. So what can I do to step into that entertainer role? Um, and so that, that's kind of how I add in in outfits and whatnot. But it does kind of help you, um, you know, sink into what you are, sink into what you're doing, you know, to. You know, what wear the outfit of it um so what what other guests have you had had on the podcast like have you had any um you know hopefully they're not listening but have you had any favorites or or <laughs> episodes that were wonderful or new things you learned from from it or oh yeah i you know from the perspective of pickleball i i feel i feel just so amazed because if i have a pickleball question and need some advice on how to do something I'm talking to all these pros at this point. Well, they're not all pros, believe me, but um, I, I can ask those questions and get those answers. So sometimes, you know, in a podcast, I what I find really interesting is either to delve really deeply into a specific aspect of the game. You know, it could be how to hit an overhead you know, how to hit a dink, how to hit a drop shot. You know, those are technical things. If you haven't played, you know, once you play, they're easy to learn. So don't worry about that. But then also there's been some really interesting stories of people. Actually, I think tomorrow night I'm interviewing somebody who lost a hundred pounds playing pickleball. What? That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I interviewed uh, actually one of the pros dropped 60 pounds playing pickleball that I interviewed and had an article on her in the pickleball fire magazine. And, um, yeah, there was also a recent podcast, um, where one of the, the guys who plays, um, not quite at the pro level, but he's, he's actually the, one of the teaching pros in the Dallas area. And, uh, I guess he said, yeah, the first couple of years playing pickleball, I dropped 25 pounds. And then I kind of talked to some of the pros and they're like, well, you know, what do I need to do to kind of take the next step in, in my career in terms of pickleball. And they're like, well, you're, you're not fast enough. So I think he dropped another 50, 60, 70 pounds. I mean, okay. it's because the game is so fun. You know, it's people spend a lot of time on the court. I mean, people will go at, I've got people who, when it's hot here in Connecticut, they'll show up at 6 30 AM <laughs> And, but, you know, they'll show up, you know, they'll show up at 6.30 or 7 and they'll stay till like 10, 10.30. I mean, literally they're spending three hours on the court and it's almost all nonstop playing. So, you wow. know, sometimes it's busy and you've got a few people, you know, not there, but, uh, you know, just uh, three hours. It's like, wow. So yeah, you could definitely drop some weight if you're playing for three hours. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's really something to be said about mixing mixing fitness with fun, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of times we think of, okay, I've got to lose weight, so I've got to go, you know, run on the treadmill or do the stair stepper for an hour, and I hate doing cardio and blah, 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 and I think that it's probably actually more difficult for our bodies, like that mind-body connection to really, um, I don't know, uh, w work properly if we're kind of internalize our, our internal thoughts and our internal um, uh, conversation with ourselves is kind of like, more negative maybe it puts us more in the fear response and so maybe our bodies don't um, break down calories and such as well i'm not entirely sure what i'm talking about but um i i i do like the prospect of you know laughing and smiling and having fun while you're doing your physical activity while while you're um, losing weight I, I think that's really something that, that's really something cool about pickleball it is and, and you know as i was saying you know people play three hours a day I know people who play twice a day and I also know people who play seven days a week, twice a day. And we're wow. not talking, we're not talking about people who are pros or anything. These are just recreational people who want to get out there and have some fun. And I totally agree with you. One of the things that I, you said, you're a runner. Well, one of the things I do not like to do is to run. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's just nothing that you can do as much as I love sports. There's nothing that you can get me to do to make me jog. I mean, it's just never going to happen. And so, you know, it, it's, it, you know, if I was, you know, really, really heavy and, and needed to lose weight, that would definitely be the last thing that I would do. But the first thing I would do would be go play pickleball. So have you, you've got to go try that. You're in Austin. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to now. I mean, I've been excited about it since we decided to do this podcast. So I'm definitely going to be excited about it even more now. So um, I'm definitely gonna. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna look it up and, and find out. Find a little community. I know I have the. Uh, there's an app um, in a website as well. Meetup.com. They they have an app, and you can kind of just put your interest in there. And I guarantee, if I go through, there's there's pickleball on there, and I, I bet you there's communities who are waiting for for new friends to come in and join and have some fun. That's true. And actually, in the Austin area, they're building a couple big pickleball complexes, like very large, you know, 40, 50 courts. And I, I believe there's already there's already one there. I'm not sure where it is. I, I was in Texas then, so I'm, I'm not sure where it is. Oh, I will definitely have to get my Google on and, and find out about that. Yeah, that, that's really cool. OK, so where do you see where do you see the sport going like the maybe the next five years, 10 years? And then also, where do you see I mean, because you're doing quite a bit of these these podcast episodes, it seems like you're really up to date on your website. Um, it's a lot of a lot of your life. So also along with that, where's pickleball going and where do you see yourself going with it? Like, are you are you going to keep riding the wave and, and see where it takes you? Or? <laughs> yeah, this for me was was definitely an unexpected, unexpected wave. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the sport itself the the goal is to everybody wants the sport to continue to grow right now even though there is some um people or it is actually on on television and it's certainly live streamed there isn't as many spectators as people would like to see in the sport now one thing to remember about pickleball is that it it really became popular for people over 50 but what's changing now is that you've got a lot more young people coming in. And I, I have to say this, and I'm definitely included in that over 50 group, is that I'm used to watching things on TV. So it, if you put it on ESPN, I'm going to be there watching on TV. It's it's a little harder for me to get into, you know, get on and, and remember, oh, yeah, it's going to be on, on YouTube and it's going to be at this time and blah, 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 blah. So I, people really want to see the viewership grow. People want to see better prize money for the pros, you know, have more sponsors come in because there's tons of sponsors that are pickleball related, but they're really looking for uh, people, sponsors really outside of the game, you know, whether it's a credit card company or, a you know, a bank or what have you, just some of the sponsors that aren't necessarily related to pickleball. And then, of course, the ultimate goal and so many people I talk to um, actually, these are kind of two related things is they want to get pickleball in every school in the U.S., you know, have that become a part of the physical education curriculum. And it really does make sense because it's easy to play. So even if you've got the kids who have to take PE and they're not that athletic, they will still enjoy it. So there are juniors leagues now starting. Uh, I've got a friend who I interviewed on the podcast 
Adam, who's got league running down in Florida, and he's working with other people throughout the country to get juniors leagues going. And then, of course, the ultimate goal is to get pickleball into the Olympics. But nice. getting a sport into the Olympics is uh, it's a long process. And they're they're really pretty much at just at the starting point of doing that. So right. they have quite a ways to go. Do you, do you see it potentially happening? What, what, what do you think? Eventually? Anyway? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it might not be for 20 years. I, it definitely won't be in Paris and it won't be in LA. I mean, it, you know, there might be a, a presence, but not officially connected um, because I believe that the exhibition sports, the demonstration sports for LA have already been agreed upon as to what they are. Mm. So maybe I'm not sure what's after LA, but maybe, uh, maybe after LA, maybe an exhibition sport, but um, yeah, that's definitely what people want to see. And given the growth of the game, it's uh, you know, it's, it's going to happen. There was um, racquetball is a sport that I played, you know, when I was young and it was an exhibition sport in the Olympics a couple of times but they never were able to take that next step and make it a official sport. And, you know, I think racquetball is a sport that was always really male dominated because it's, you've got this, this, it's a rubber ball, but it's, it's hard, especially if it hits you. And then you're like in this enclosed space, whereas it's almost, you know, normally when you go to the pickleball courts, it's about 50, 50 in terms of men and women playing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's cool to have, you know, a, a different amount of diversity and not really have, it's not just this, you've got to be really good at it. You've got to be really athletic. You get to enjoy it, you know, the whole along the way, regardless of your athletic ability. Yeah. And it, it's, it is not like a sport like tennis where you need to have like really good technique in order to get the ball over the net. Mm. It's very easy to get the ball over the net and pick a ball so you don't have to worry about taking all these lessons and stuff. You don't need that. The first time you go play pickleball, you will have fun. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So, okay, so someone, um, it looks like for me, I'm in Austin, so I could probably get a Google search and, and find um, the facility you were talking about and in some community. So how about other listeners across the U.S.? If they're, if they're interested, they want to go, do you th- would you just send them to your website first and foremost, you think? On, yes, on the Pickleball Fire website, if you go to uh, pickleballfire.com slash courts, you will be able to find places to play near you. There's also some information on places that have clinics. You know, if you, you don't necessarily need to go to a clinic to get started, but I know some people might feel more comfortable doing that. Honestly, you can just look for where they have courts and uh, show up, especially like at this time of the year when it's warm out, you will you will find pickleball in the morning, usually at most places kind of seven, seven days a week, although that does vary a bit. Uh, but um, yeah, just, just come to the website and you look up courts and you should be able to find something nearby. The courts are, courts are now everywhere, even in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I you know, I, I hope we can encourage more people to, uh, to try out the sport, you know, maybe they, if they've never heard of it, if they want to try it for the first time, or if they have played it, maybe they played it back in high school or whatever. And, and they kind of forgot about it. I would, I would, uh, I, I would hope that, that this conversation would kind of poke and prod people towards checking it out again. Cause that's definitely something we need right now, you know, is is some form of community, um, obviously some athletic, some athleticism, some movement, you know, that's, that's a good way to, to keep our immune systems and our our health up up to date too, you know, is, is working out and finding a fun way to do it. So, um, as far, as far as your website, Lynn, what else, what else can we find there? I think we're kind of rounding the corner towards the end here. I just want to make sure everybody has all the info on you, wh- where to find you, um, how to listen to your podcast, what else they may, might be able to uh, get from your website and everything. Great question. Yeah, definitely come to pickleballfire.com. You can find a link to the podcast there where you can learn more about the game. I also have a digital magazine and you can find that right in the main menu on the website just says magazine. It's um, free. So you can uh, get a little bit more idea of 
what the sport is about and, you know, learn about maybe some of the pros and who they are just to get familiar with the game. Again, you can come there and get information on tournaments, clinics, courts. You can also get information on instructors. So if you are somebody who wants to take a lesson to get started, you can just put in your zip code and you can find somebody who is near you. I've got a, a pretty good list of, of folks who instruct throughout the U.S. And then again, if you just want to figure out how to play the game, you know, I have information there on rules and I have a kind of a beginner series that you can go through in terms of different articles, learning about the game kind of takes you step by step, kind of one, one lesson at a week. And then, uh, you know, like you said, at the beginning of the podcast, I also do have um, information on, on different products, uh, whether it's uh, paddles, balls, nets, uh, shoes, it's all, it's all there. So pickleballfire.com is pretty much a one-stop shop for anything related to pickleball. Yeah. Wow. I love it. That's so great. Uh, Lynn, I really appreciate your, ch- your time. I mean, I, I, um, thank you for, for coming on here and kind of giving us the lowdown and answering my rambling questions. I, I appreciate it. Um, I do have one more question. I do like to ask many of the guests towards the end, um, if, if, if you're willing and, and, and down for this question, what does the world need more of right now? You know, what the world needs more of is just people who can get along and uh, enjoy themselves and have fun. And, you know, I think that's that that's another thing like with pickleball is you don't see a lot of conflict on on the court. You know, people are gracious and and, and nice and try and make the right line calls. So, um, yeah, just, you know, treat each other like you want to be treated. 100%. Hundred percent. I, I love that answer. It's great. It's amazing. Um, again, thank you so much for your time, Lynn. Um, everybody, go check out Pickleball Fire. Um, love yourselves. Drink some water. Stretch. Take care of yourselves. Um, go explore the community. Check it out. Have a have a smile on your face while you're doing that fitness thing. How about that? Um, all right, folks. Have a good rest of your day, Lynn. Thanks one more time. You have a good rest of your day as well. Um, if you need anything from me, we'll be in touch via email. Thank you. Okay, take care. The Junkyard Love Podcast.